El día de hoy tenemos realmente la fortuna de tener expertos en el, en el tema, la doctora Catherine Steingas y el doctor Juan Francisco Lozano de National White Children Institute. Me voy a permitir dar una, una pequeña reseña del extenso currículum que ambos tienen. La doctora Catherine Steingas estudió medicina en Medical College of Ohio. La especialidad de pediatría la realizó en National White Children's Hospital en Ohio. Y la subespecialidad Development and Behavior Pediatrics en Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital en Cleveland, Ohio. Es directora de... de del programa Developmental and Behavior Pediatrics y Fellowship en, en esa institución. Y es profesora asistente del Departamento de Pediatría de Ohio State University College of, of Medicine. Cuenta con amplias eh, certificaciones, en, entre ellas eh, eh, como pediatra y también certificada en el manejo de, la, de eh, discapacidades del desarrollo y del paciente complejo. Sus líneas de investigación están precisamente en, en desarrollo en, las, en los pacientes con discapacidades. El doctor Juan, Juan Francisco Lozano eh, estudió en nuestra Escuela de, de Medicina y Ciencias de la Salud del Tecnológico de Monterrey. Nos da mucho orgullo y, y, y mucho gusto este, que esté con nosotros el día de hoy. Realizó una maestría en investigación clínica y, y administración regulatoria en Northwestern University en Illinois. La especialidad de pediatría la realizó en, en Children's Hospital of Michigan en Detroit y se encuentra en realizando la subespecialidad Developmental and Behavior Pediatrics en Nationwide eh, Children's Hospital, Columbus, Ohio. Se encuentra en uno de los hospitales que ha recibido un reconocimiento como de los mejores centros pediátricos en la Unión eh, Americana. Cuenta con certificaciones tanto en pediatría, en investigación clínica y está obteniendo diversas eh, eh, certificaciones de, para poder abordar los, los problemas de discapacidad del neurodesarrollo. Eh, on behalf uh, uh, of, the, of School of Medicine in, in Health Science Tecnológico de Monterrey, you're most welcome. Dr. Catherine Steingas, Dr. Juan Francisco Lozano. It is a pleasure and an honor to have you with us in this morning in our grand rounds. We're looking forward to hear from you. So let's get started. Muchísimas gracias por la invitación. El día de hoy vamos a, como decía el doctor Valencia, vamos a estar hablando sobre parálisis cerebral y algunos de los abordajes diagnósticos y generalidades eh, en el tema. Eh, algunos de los objetivos que tenemos para el día de hoy es, all right, Kathy, next, please. es a la conclusión, vamos a, a, a saber sobre el, cuál es el proceso evaluativo de un paciente con eh, un retraso de motor, la importancia de la detección temprana, eh, para reconocer las, algunas de las herramientas que tenemos para quitar ese diagnóstico y cuáles son la evidencia detrás de las intervenciones para niños con parálisis cerebral. Next, please. Es, eh, an, la parálisis cerebral es una de las discapacidades motoras o físicas más comunes en la, en la niñez. Eh, hay diferentes estadísticas. A nivel de Estados Unidos se calcula de 2.5 a 3 casos por cada niño y, y comparado a nivel mundial puede ser un poquito mayor. Y esto varía dependiendo de cuáles son las eh, pues, herramientas diagnósticas y cuáles los factores de riesgo presentes en cada país eh, y las intervenciones que hay presentes para cada eh, población. Next, please. Eh, Vamos a empezar con un pequeño caso y este es eh, algo que podemos ver dentro de nuestra consulta. Un niño de un año y un mes, eh, realmente sin, sin mucha historia clínica relevante eh, y se presenta porque los papás tienen preocupación de que el niño, el, el niño no está caminando eh, como lo hizo su hermana. Eh, pero también que no se puede sentar sin apoyo, eh, aún no gatea y no se está este, empujando para eh, levantarse. Y la mamá pregunta, pues, ¿qué es lo que está sucediendo? Next, please. Eh, entonces, aquí la pregunta es, y si pueden sacar los polls, es, 
como pediatras, ¿cuál sería su siguiente paso? ¿Qué harían dentro de la eh, consulta? Eh, ¿Harían un monitoreo del desarrollo? O sea, le preguntaría, le dirían a la familia, nos vemos dentro de un par de meses, lo referirían a terapia física, eh, le administrarían un tamizaje del desarrollo o eh, obtienen una resonancia magnética. Vamos a ver qué es lo que contesta la gran mayoría de ustedes. Ay, pero, perdón, es la primera pregunta. Eh, veo que hay, hay dos preguntas y están contestando las dos. Eh. Ok. Y digo, no han sido la gran mayoría de ustedes que estén haciendo, eh, pero veo, vemos una tendencia que la gran mayoría está contestando administrar un tamizaje del neurodesarrollo y algunos, eh, en, en segundo lugar, diría, están diciendo el monitoreo. Eh, entonces, next one, please, Kathy. Entonces, al, al estar evaluando a un niño que se presenta con algún problema del desarrollo, eh, la recomendación de la Academia Americana de Pediatría es lo que la gran mayoría de ustedes contestó, es administrar un tamizaje. Y como habíamos hablado anteriormente, es, se administra los 9, 18 y 24 o 30 meses. Y hay una recomendación específica de, la, de las guías motoras que a los a los 48 meses, a evaluar también para ver si hay algún problema eh, de coordinación, grafomotor. Y hacemos un monitoreo del desarrollo en cada visita de niño sano. Next, please. Cuando se presenta un niño con un retraso motor, next one, eh, nuestra evaluación inicial es pues, realmente hacer una historia clínica, hacer mediciones generales. Tenemos que hacer algunas observaciones para ver si hay algunos otros rasgos eh, que nos apunten a algo de tono muscular, eh, ver cómo respira el niño. Entonces, está a ser una muy buena observación y palpar el abdomen buscando eh, patosplenomegalia para ver si hay algo más que, seas, que no sea solo motor neurológico. Y hacer un examen neuromotor completo. Este, estamos viendo todos los movimientos generales, entonces si, si hay alguna preferencia motora, la, la fuerza, también el tono, los reflejos eh, y algo de pues, cómo son sus movimientos. Next, please. Eh, esta imagen es una sección de todo el algoritmo de la, de la guía clínica de la Academia Americana de Pediatría para niños con retrasos motores. Entonces, este no es específicamente para parálisis cerebral, pero es ese niño que entra a tu consulta con eh, una preocupación sobre el desarrollo motor. Y, y después de haber hecho toda esa historia clínica y evaluación, al final nosotros como clínicos decidimos, ok, este niño tiene un tono muscular normal, bajo o eh, elevado. Y aquí es donde tomamos esa decisión. Si el sí recomienda al pediatra que si encuentra a un niño con un tono muscular elevado, eh, o sea, estamos en eh, un niño hipertónico, eh, tomar una resonancia magnética. Eh, si es un niño hipotónico, entonces hacemos una evaluación nomás de tamizaje para tomar una, una, eh, una creatiniquinasa y unas pruebas de función tiroidea, para a la misma vez empezar todo ese proceso de intervención. Entonces, referir a intervención temprana, consultar con... Eh, neurología, este, pediatría del neurodesarrollo, quien sea quien dé estos servicios en la comunidad en la que está. Eh, siguiente. Next, please. El diagnóstico diferencial de estos niños es, pues, eh, es amplio. Eh, estamos desde un problema motor eh, muy específico neurológico, problemas de coordinación, a una entidad genética, neurodegenerativa, metabólica. Entonces, tenemos que tener un amplio criterio diagnóstico al estar evaluando. Next, please. ¿Y cómo vamos a llegar a, a identificar a estos niños? Es pues, teniendo muy claro que pueden haber ciertas señales de alerta que estamos tratando de ver dentro de nuestro monitoreo si no cae dentro de nuestro tamizaje. Entonces, este, obviamente, lo, que no esté cumpliendo sus hitos del desarrollo, pero también viendo cómo se alimenta cómo utiliza sus extremidades, el tono muscular, si todavía están presentes ciertos reflejos primitivos, eh, que no tenga ciertas reacciones protectoras eh, 
de los reflejos naturales y si hay algún factor de riesgo ya previamente identificado. Estos son niños que tienen que tener un seguimiento más cercano. Next, please. Eh, entonces, ahora le paso el control a la doctora Steingas. So, go ahead, Dr. Steingas. Lead us through our next piece. Morning. Um, great to have this opportunity. So we're going to talk some more about um, cerebral palsy now and um, more into the diagno diagnosis and treatment. Um, so the most current consensus definition of cerebral palsy is that, and this is from um, 2007, Um, is that it describes a group of permanent disorders that affect development of movement and posture and cause activity limitations. And it's attributed to a non-progressive disturbance that occurred in the developing fetal or infant brain. And then these motor disorders are often accompanied by disturbances of sensation, cognition, communication, perception, behavior, or seizures. A number of different brain injuries and malformations can lead to the clinical picture of CP. These injuries are considered static or non-progressive, um, but the disorder is dynamic in that the physical manifestations and the types of movement problems can change over time as the child grows and develops. Uh, this short chart shows the proportion of children um, with CP who have a history of preterm birth in purple And then the yellow is those who were born at term and had neonatal encephalopathy. Um, as you can see in the orange then, almost half of children who go on to have CP were born at term and did not require um, specialized newborn care. So in other words, they do not have identifiable early risk factors for CP. Um, and the developmental screening and surveillance within primary care at well visits is particularly important to identify um, these this group um, that is not identified as high risk. So risk factors for CP can include things that occur prenatally or perinatally um, or a neonatal brain injury related to preterm birth, such as periventricular leukomalacia or interventricular hemorrhage. A postnatal brain injury or infection like meningitis can also lead to CP if it occurs early in childhood. CP is a clinical diagnosis that is made on the basis of the motor impairment and the abnormal tone and movement patterns. There's not one test that is specifically diagnostic of CP in and of itself, um, but there are a number of useful tools that can be used in addition to a neuro exam um, that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, ideally, evaluation for CP is done by a neurodevelopmental team that may include a developmental pediatrician or child neurologist um, and a, a physical or occupational therapist to um, assess motor development. And in young children, this diagnosis may require a series of assessments to, to determine what their motor trajectory is over time and are, are they catching up or are, are there delays persistent? Um, Traditionally, CP has been diagnosed around age two years of age, but there's wide variability um, and definitely a push for that to be earlier. Um, majority of parents will suspect there is a problem before um, a diagnosis is made or before a medical provider brings up the possibility. So these questions here are a couple examples from um, things I heard from parents when I was doing NICU follow-up clinic that illustrate that parents really do have a sense of what is going on before being given a diagnosis by a medical provider. The, the question, are they going to get diagnosed with CP today was actually asked by a mother of twins. They were I think about a year corrected to the nurse as she was weighing them. Um, so she was, mom was um, kind of ahead of the medical team in, in thinking about this. Um, in 2017, there were international guidelines published for early diagnosis and intervention for cerebral palsy. Um, and they assert that the diagnosis of CP can and should be made as early as possible. 
And when a diagnosis cannot be made definitively in a, in a young infant, then an interim dose of um, high risk for CP should be given to communicate that this child needs CP specific early developmental interventions to kind of have that focus in their physical and occupational therapy. And they also recommend that early standardized assessment for detection of CP should be conducted in high-risk populations, so those who, um, those babies who were premature or who have a history of neonatal encephalopathy. So our next poll question is um, you know, thinking about how early is early? So use the poll to indicate what's the youngest age you would feel comfortable making a diagnosis of CP. Give this a second to go through. So it looks like we have have a spectrum of of ages in there, with the majority in the six to twelve month range. Um, so the this. Um, Um, the the international guideline the um, sorry about that um, the recommendation is that to try to make a diagnosis of at least the high risk of CP um, by age six months, which is younger than a lot of people have felt comfortable. Um, in the you kind know, of Australians have been probably at the at the head of this early diagnosis, um, but in in the US, just in the last few years, this um, age of diagnosis has been kind of trending down from more than 18 to 24 months to really trying to get closer to six to 12 months. Um, so there's multiple reasons that it's important to identify CP early. We know that neuroplasticity, which is the capacity of the brain to adapt structurally and functionally in response to experience and intervention is greatest in younger children. The early diagnosis of CP can lead to CP specific early interventions that capitalize on this neuroplasticity. And it can also allow for prevention of secondary complications such as hip dysplasia, which could progress to dislocation. The early diagnosis also enables families to receive support and education specific to their child's diagnosis and needs. And then in addition, um, early diagnosis facilitates research on which interventions are most effective for CP and may allow a child to have an opportunity to receive more intensive intervention on a research basis. We have a, a few studies going on in our hospital um, for kids in the, the six to 24 month range with CP or high risk for CP, um, kind of studying which intensity of, of therapy is most effective. So in the, in the international guidelines published in 2017 by Novak and colleagues recommend several tools to help with early CP diagnosis. The assessments that are most useful prior to five months of age are the general movements assessment, the Hammersmith Infant Neurologic Examination, or the HINE, and brain imaging with an MRI. The assessments that are useful after five months are the HINE, brain MRI, and then the DC or AIMS to assess for developmental delay. Okay. So the general movements assessment was developed by Heinz Prechtel in the 1980s. Um, so it's been used in, in Europe for quite a while. Um, he said just been being used in the US um, more in the last five years or so. Um, and so it's based on an observation of an infant's spontaneous movement. So it's an exam that occurs without even touching the baby. So it can be used in the NICU starting at 26 weeks gestational age up to 20 weeks post-term. Um, and this assessment has really good sensitivity and specificity. It's about 98% sensitive. Um, at the age of three months um, for predicting CP when, it's about, when the evaluation is done by a trained and experienced observer. Um, this does require specialized training though and regular use to maintain that reliability. 
the HINE is a standardized scored neurologic evaluation that was developed by Lily and Victor Dubowitz. And it can be used between ages of two to 24 months. Um, and it also has good sens sensitivity and specificity and can also help with predicting the severity of motor impairment. So there are scores that are you know, no ranges that are known to um, be associated with like, whether or not the child's going to be walking at um, age two. Um, it should be noted though that the studies that evaluating the sensitivity and specificity for both the general movements and the hind have been primarily done in infants who are known to be at high risk for CP due to prematurity or neonatal encephalopathy. They haven't been looked at um, much as far as just routine healthy babies and what would the utility be of doing them um, the hind and say a, a well visit. Um, the Alberta Infant Motor Scale, or AIMS, um, is used to assess gross motor developmental skills from birth to 18 months. And then the Developmental Assessment of Young Children, or DACI, can assess several domains of development, and this one can be used up to age 11. Once a diagnosis of CP has been made, it can be helpful to classify it in a few different ways. So one is the type of tone or movement disorder. Spastic CP is by far the most common, um, but other types include dyskinetic, ataxic, and hypotonic CP. And then another way to classify it is by the topography um, or which parts of the body are affected. Unilateral CP is described as hemiplegic, um, so either the right arm and leg or left. Um, and then bilateral symptoms may be described as quadriplegia if all four limbs are affected, um, diplegia if it's primarily the legs, um, and then there are some individuals who um, have triplegia where there's relative um, sparing of one of the arms that's um, not very affected. The Gross Motor Functional Classification System, or GMFCS, uh, provides a system in a common language for describing the severity of motor impairment. This can range from a level one, um, which is mild deficits and higher level skills, such as running and jumping, but walking pretty well without limitations, um, then up to a level five, which indicates severe motor disability um, in which children are transported by others in a wheelchair. 60% of individuals with CP, so majority are a level one or two, meaning that they can walk independently um, by the time they're about four. Um, those with more, Severe motor impairment, the fours and fives are a smaller portion of individuals with CP, but they tend to have higher rates of comorbidities. So they often have more interactions with the medical system. Although CP is a motor disorder that's caused by an injury to the brain, there may be difficulties in other areas of the nervous system, as well as non neurologic comorbidities affecting almost every organ system. Um, so not every child is going to have all of these comorbidities, um, but often children will have several of these. Um, almost 50% of children with CP also have an intellectual disability and more have specific learning disabilities. Um, it is important to note though that CP is not always associated with cognitive impairment and some individuals even with severe motor impairment can have typical cognitive development. Um, 60 to 80% of children with CP have communication difficulties, um, and about 25% are nonverbal. Seizure disorders are also common, affecting around 35 to 60%. Um, many individuals with CP have dysphagia or other difficulties with feeding and growth, and about one out of 15 um, receive their nutrition through a feeding tube. Some of the other common comorbidities include um, Sleep problems such as fall, difficulty falling and staying asleep and sleep disordered breathing um, and GI problems, particularly gastroesophageal reflux and constipation, which each affect about 75% of patients. Um, sialuria or problematic drooling is seen in about one third of children with CP. And then orthopedic complications can include joint contractures, scoliosis and dysplasia, hip dysplasia. Um, and osteopenia can lead to fractures, particularly in patients who are non-ambulatory. 
So interventions for CP have really expanded rapidly in the past decade. So chronic conditions such as CP often don't have a, a specific treatment that leads to a cure, um, but there are interventions. And the international classification of functioning disability and health um, is a way to, to look at that different from the traditional medical model approach to healthcare. So this is more of a biopsychosocial model, model to describe a, for a framework to describe um, and organize the information on function and disability um, and to recognize the interplay between the health condition, the environmental influence and personal and family factors. Um, and so use of this framework to approach the care of individuals with CP helps us shift the focus from focusing just on the specific impairments. So the, um, the left side of this um, diagram, the left green um, rectangle, um, to thinking about the whole person and from here to promotion of function, participation, and quality of life. And so Peter Rosenbaum, who is um, co-founded the Canadian Can Child Center for Childhood Disability, has conceptualized this these ICF domains in um, regards to childhood disabilities as six F words that I like. Um, I think is a, a nice way to think about intervention. So these are function, family, fitness, fun, friends, and future. So considering these aspects of a child's life helps us as medical providers to focus on the child and family strengths and optimizing developmental health and not just focusing on the, the body structure and function. Um, so this approach can help be helpful in guiding our intervention planning and how we approach discussions with patients and families. Um, so earlier this year, um, Novak and colleagues, some of the same group that um, than the international guidelines, they published a systematic review that describes the current state of evidence for a wide range of interventions for CP. This review uses the World Health Organization's grade evidence rating system and the evidence alert traffic light system. So this traffic light system color codes interventions based on the quality of evidence and their effectiveness. So interventions that are coded green are do it, so they have high quality evidence indicating effectiveness, while well, those coded red or don't do it, um, have high quality evidence indicating that they're ineffective or harmful. And then those classified as yellow um, signifies weaker or limited evidence um, or conflicting findings in the research, really areas that more research is needed. So this is not something that's probably gonna be to read on the screen, but just gives you um, an idea of how that visual representation is um, in this, in this article, um, the, the larger circles for an intervention signify a larger body of evidence. Um, and then the dotted line, the authors call the worth it line. So for interventions above this line, the evidence in favor of using it likely outweighs the evidence against it. Whereas those below that um, are things that we're really gonna be more likely to discourage or recommend against. As you can see, See, the, the greatest number are still yellow. Um, so there is still a lot of, of research to be done, but um, there, there are more green than their initial version of this that was published in 2013. So we are learning more. Um, so this review includes both preventative and management interventions. The majority of the management interventions fall in the realm of allied health treatments. Um, such as physical and occupational therapies. Um, and then there's also pharmacological, surgical, and complementary and alternative intervention included. Um, so we're just gonna focus on a more closely on a few of these areas this morning. Um, so in thinking about um, motor interventions, such as our kind of our core problem with cerebral palsy, there are multiple studies that show that therapies are most effective for improving motor function and self-care when they're focused on goals that are set by the child and family 
and when they involve task specific training. Um, so for example, if the family's goal is for the child to be able to feed himself, then therapy activities that specifically practice handling eating utensils are more effective than just activ therapy activities that strengthen the upper extremities in general. And some other um, green light interventions for improving hand and upper extremity and function are constraint-induced movement therapy or CIMT um, by manual training, and then the constraint therapy in conjunction with botulinum toxin injections to, um, to treat the spasticity. So the constraint therapy is an intervention that's specific to unilateral CP. Um, so the unaffected, the, the stronger arm is constrained using a mitt or a splint. Um, and then the child is need, practices using fine motor, doing fine motor activities with their affected hand. Um, so really trying to get that, force that other hand to, to do more work essentially. Um, and then biomanual therapy focuses on learning to use both hands together to complete tasks. And the intensity is really the key to success, both with constraint therapy and by manual therapy. So it's often a burst of several hours of therapy, a couple of hours a day, several days a week for a month. Um, so one study's protocol was 90 hours of therapy over a three week period, um, but we can really see um, some nice improvement in upper extremity function with a, with a burst of intense therapy like this. Functional gait and mobility training are some green light interventions to improve walking speed and endurance. And doing this on a treadmill um, allows for repeated practice of that stepping motion in a controlled environment. Um, and then they can increase the intensity or the speed of the treadmill. Mill. Um, hippotherapy or therapeutic horseback riding is classified as yellow in regards to motor function. So there's actually good evidence um, to support hippotherapy to improve balance and posture. So in some domains, be considered green. Um, we, don't, we don't have as much evidence that this improvement in posture um, translates into improvement in actual motor function. And similarly, a selective dorsal rhizotomy surgery um, is yellow for improving motor, motor function, although it is a good green light or has good evidence um, specifically for treating spasticity. And then moving to the red, um, this review classifies several interventions as red light that they recommend against their use in children with CP. Um, so in this hyperbaric oxygen treatment um, has not been shown to improve motor function and there are associated risk of harm, including hearing loss and pain. Um, the systematic review also found that evidence does not support cranial sacral osteopathy to improve motor function or the use of sensory integration to improve sensory organization or motor skills in these children with CP. Neurodevelopmental therapy or NDT, or it's also called BOBATH, um, has traditionally been a common mode of, of therapy for CP. In its original form, this NDC NDT was more of a passive approach in which the therapist would position and handle the child in certain ways with the goal of improving the tone and postural control. But increasing evidence indicates that therapies that are focused on motor learning theory, so when the child is actively engaged in motor planning and trying to move, are, are more effective than passive interventions. So the this has led to this being classified as a, as a red intervention um, as there are more effective interventions available. This classification is not without controversy though. There are, there are still people very into neurodevelopmental treatment. Um, and the, the other challenging piece is that as this has evolved over time, there's variability in how different people define it and practice it, which makes it harder to interpret the evidence. So there are some therapists who are using aspects of neurodevelopmental therapy who are also incorporating more active therapy strategies, which, which are more evidence-based, so kind of doing a mix of things. So a key point in providing guidance to families as you're thinking about the, the evidence for interventions is that um, 
we want interventions that promote child initiated movement and participation in functional activities rather than the child being passively moved by the therapist or the parents. Um, for tone, there are several interventions that are rated green, um, including Botox injections, selective dorsal rhizotomy, um, diazepam, and intrathecal baclofen. Um, these are all for improving spasticity. Um, and then in thinking about preventing and treating contractures and promoting good body alignment, lower limb serial casting um, or Botox plus serial casting have really good evidence for treatment of contractures, particularly contractures at the ankle. Um, there's evidence is less strong for just stretching to treat contractures. So often the brief duration of that's just by manual stretching or like the parent or child doing exercises to stretch is not enough to um, actually improve the range of motion. And then you need that more constant stretch from a, a serial cast that's placed on for perhaps a week or so to really give that constant stretch for um, to improve range of motion at the joint. Um, and hip surveillance um, with periodic pelvic x-rays also has good evidence for improving early detection of hip dysplasia so that then they're to prevent progression to subluxation and dislocation. The Austral there are Australian hip surveillance guidelines that outline a recommended frequency of hip x-rays based on the child's age and their GMFCS level, so their degree of motor severity. Um, and then when if an x-ray is showing that um, the femoral head is more than 30% laterally, has migrated more than 30% out of the, the bony acetabulum of the hip, then that is um, a red flag that this is a hip is at high risk of being a progressively subluxation um, and would be an indication to refer to orthopedic. Use of complementary and alternative medicine is also pretty common in CP. Um, it's about 25 to 50% of parents of children with CP report using CAM compared to about 12% of children overall. Um, this is more often used um, when the child has more severe motor impairment than, than less severe. So the, there's an American Academy of Pediatrics clinical report um, entitled pediatric integrative medicine that provides some guidance to um, approaching complementary medicine using the framework depicted here. Um, so thinking about is the therapy effective and is the therapy safe? So a provider may decide to recommend a therapy if the evidence shows that it's both safe and effective or to tolerate if a family wants to try something if there isn't um, maybe may not be good evidence for effectiveness, but it's considered safe. Um, for therapies that are effective, but carry more significant risk, the provider may choose um, to closely monitor to see if the therapy is benefiting this child or if they are having adverse effects um, or to discourage the use depending on the specific therapy in the situation. And then for therapies that um, we know are neither safe nor effective, um, then those are the ones that, that we would want to discourage um, families from pursuing. And then thinking about the benefits and risks, we wanna think about risks beyond just bodily harm and adverse effects, but thinking about the time commitment that may be involved, the financial cost, and then the potential loss of benefit from pursuing a treatment that has more, intervent more evidence for effectiveness. Um, and kind of shifting to thinking about managing children with CP in the primary care medical home. Um, as with all children, a key role of the medical home um, for children with CP is to provide for that preventative care and immunizations and anticipatory guidance. Um, and then as Dr. Lozano was talking earlier, primary care providers play an important role in early identification of CP through developmental surveillance and screening for motor delays in young children. Um, and then this early diagnosis and intervention can improve those outcomes for CP by taking advantage of the, that early brain neuroplasticity. So after the diagnosis, 
of CP is made, the pediatrician can then assist the family with connecting to community resources, to intervention services like physical and occupational therapy, and as well as family support groups. And then we mentioned the, the wide number of comorbidities. So these are often um, something the primary care physician is going to take a lead in managing, although there are some where a specialist involvement will be beneficial. Um, and then another key role of the primary care provider is to integrate care across multiple specialists to ensure that all of the child's needs are being addressed um, and that the families aren't receiving conflicting recommendations. So children with CP benefit from a multidisciplinary approach to care, um, whether those team members are all co-located in the same clinic like a CP team, or they may be in different medical centers or in the community. Some of the specific team members for an individual child will vary depending on the child's severity and comorbidities, as well as what specialists and services are available in their region. Um, so each child needs CP needs a primary care medical home, um, and many will also see other medical specialists, um, as well as therapists such as PT, OT, and speech. And then some other team members may include their school services, family support groups, other community resources, um, psychology, home health providers, um, durable medical equipment providers for things like wheelchairs and braces, um, and then also adaptive recreation opportunities um, that can, such as um, you know, wheelchair basketball or wheelchair soccer that uh, may provide an opportunity for your children to participate in some of those sports activities. So in summary, um, developmental screening in the primary care medical home is a key to early diagnosis of cerebral palsy. Um, early intervention and diagnosis leads to prompt um, care and specific interventions. Um, and then as pediatricians, we can advocate for interventions that are family-centered and goal-directed and evidence-based. And we'll have some time for questions then. Yeah. So, uh, so thank you. Uh, I'm receiving some of the questions here, uh, that okay. I guess. Uh, so um, one of the questions is, what results um, are expected or what are the benefits of using either acupuncture, uh, hypotherapy, or hydrotherapy? So those are, um, those are under the motor, the motor. So those are looking at different ways of improving um, motor function. Um, and so within that big, I'm gonna go back to this, um, to this thing they have. Um, so they talk about, and I don't know if you can see this. So some of the things they're looking at as far as classifying that there can be benefits from like the hydrotherapy um, and hypotherapy are in gross motor skills. Um, the acupuncture, again, there's some with gross motor skills. I think there's more with um, use of that for um, thinking about chronic pain in, in these patients. Um, so there are, um, there are a lot of these interventions that are in this, this yellow range where there may be some studies that have reported benefit, some that have not. Um, but they're pretty low risk or low risk of harm. So that also plays into considering them kind of above the worth it line if it's something that um, a family is interested in trying. Yeah, and, and kind of just adding to that, I mean, I, th I think we see it as kind of th those uh, complementary and alternative methods that we are adding to whatever other services a child is receiving. So if there's no harm, and we could see some benefit, then they can try it. Yeah, and especially with the with the hypotherapy. So um, we don't on here, but there there is good evidence for hypotherapy for certain things like the balance and coordination. What we don't know is how well that translates in. Does actually does the child walk better or have better mobility? So um, that is particularly something we may recommend. Um, it needs. Search, but 
um, can be within the realm of kind of moving from complementary and alternative to more within traditional physical therapy. Um, but again, we, we would like to think of a lot of these as more complementary or in addition to the traditional interventions rather than as an alternative to them. Right. Um, now, one of the questions is, and I'll answer probably this one is, if we know about centers in Mexico that uh, uh, support patients uh, and that kind of like medical home uh, integral uh, format. Um, in, pues en Monterrey es específicamente el, el Instituto No Amanecer. Sabemos que tiene ese, ese modelo de, de atención en equipo eh, y, y apoya a estas familias de, de manera integral. Y, y digo, realmente no, no conozco, por ejemplo, los centros Teletón muy es, eh, en, eh, en su formación, en su... Como, eh, tienen el equipo eh, armado, pero probablemente sería alguna otra alternativa este, para las familias que es, que es lo que recomendamos, que es que vayan a un centro en los que puedan ver a ortopedia, a rehabilitación física, eh, a los terapeutas, a, a pediatría, neurología, y que todos estén dentro de un mismo equipo y estén hablando. Entonces, esas, eh, al menos en Monterrey, el Instituto No Amanecer es una excelente opción. Uh, another question is... Um, Hmm. What is your opinion about the administration of cerebral lysine for the treatment of cerebral palsy? I'm going to have to admit, I am not, that is not, um, not a treatment I'm familiar with. And kind of like as, as I saw that question, kind of like for the audience, I just did a quick PubMed search as we were, as the question came in. And that quick line search of cerebral, cerebral lysing and cerebral palsy, so putting in PubMed, uh, gave me one study uh, in 2017. So that just talks about probably it's not being uh, widely used. And, and just typing cerebral lysing as such, it's primarily used in adults with like stroke and Alzheimer's. Um, so, so yeah, what, it's not, uh, as Dr. Sanya said, it's not something that we use, at least in our practice. And I, I'm pretty sure it's not on, this is only like a fourth, but I'm, what's on the screen is like a fourth of what the whole diagram is in this article. And I'm pretty sure that that, that is not even classified on there. So, right. so maybe it will be in the next version in another five yeah. to 10 years, but. <laughs> Sounds like it's something that still needs some more research before we're ready to recommend it. Correct. Now, um, what about uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation as uh, a therapeutic modality in motor function or dystonia? Yeah, and again, that's, that's something that's um, kind of in that yellow realm. It's not something that we're actually using here. Um, it's something that that's being studied. Um, I think it's also, there's not, as far as, as there's not a lot of physical risk from it. Although certainly some of those therapies like that can have a cost risk to them. I think that that's something that is probably still in the realm of what, what are we, what might we be doing with it in five years as there, um, as more of the research is in the early stage with that. Right. Um. And, and a lot of the, func the, the treatments that we currently recommend, again, they're based on function and what are the goals of the family. So it becomes more of a, a passive approach to, to intervention. Um, I know uh, if one, just answering one of the questions that we, we talked previously about the centers in Mexico. So el Centro Teletón confirman que sí es una muy buena opción y hablan sobre el Centro CRE. Eh, de rehabilitación del DIF como otra buena opción. All right. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions, uh, Dr. Valencia or anyone else. Uh, okay, so here's a question. Um, in what moment do you decide of sending uh, genetic studies in kids with cerebral palsy? All right, that's a, a very interesting question. I think is a, is a moving target. So. 
Additionally, in the in the original guidelines for working up um, etiology of cerebral palsy, genetic testing was not recommended for for every child. So really thinking about more um, those kids that we don't have a clear reason. So there are kids where um, you know they were born at 24 weeks or they had um, had a hypoxic insult, and so we have a pretty clear idea of what caused it. But there are other kids who, um, who have CP and we, we don't have that history. And especially if um, you have a brain MRI that doesn't match um, what the child has. So if we have a child with significant motor impairment and we're not showing um, signs of injury on the brain MRI, then we really need to look, for, look further and think about um, what other, um, whether it's uh, an alternative diagnosis or something that maybe looks like CP, but could actually over time be progressive, um, or there are also things that we would consider a genetic cause for CP, um, where it's, um, it's non-progressive. And there are different people will define, kind of use that term differently. Um, we, we, we will, uh, for a lot of our kids that have a genetic condition and clinically look like cerebral palsy, we will still use that diagnosis because it, um, it, it provides a good clinical framework. Um, there are other places that may focus on the genetic diagnosis. But interestingly, at the American Academy of Cerebral Palsy and Developmental Medicine that just occurred a couple weeks ago, there was a, a session on genetic testing in kids with CP. And the, the people doing that were really advocating that we really should be doing more genetic testing in all kids with CP because even those who were born prematurely, um, maybe there are some genetic factors that put them more at risk for having an interventricular hemorrhage. So, um, and they were talking more about the whole exome sequencing. Um, and that again, is kind of, there was like an early proposal thinking that, you know, maybe the, the guidelines for workup of CP may need to be revised. That's not, a wide standing recommendation. Um, I think our practice here at Nationwide um, is really those kids that we, we don't have a clear reason for um, once we've done a good history and done their, their brain imaging. Um, then we would, we would proceed with some genetic testing, usually starting with a microarray. Um, and then if we're, if we're still really concerned, sending on to genetics for more specific testing. All right. Uh, there's a question here about, are there specific uh, anti-seizure medications, antiepileptics that have better efficacy in patients with CP? I, I don't think there are really certain ones that I, it depends on the seizure type. Um, you know, there are sometimes where they will try to, some of the, the medications like um, Anti, and I'm forgetting the the generic name for that, that will also treat tone that may be more likely to do to try to get to treat two things at once. Um, but it, there's not it, not a specific seizure medication that because of the CP diagnosis, we would see more kids on. It would be, is the neurologists are thinking about what kind of, what do the, this child seizures look like? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, in your experience, what is the tip the, the type of therapy that you recommend to a child with an early diagnosis that it's younger than one? Do you recommend Bobet, Bodja? So um, we really recommend that, um, that goal-directed and that um, more therapy based on motor planning theory. So um, I don't think the Voja is, well, Voja is on here. It's it's a yellow, but it's under the worth it line. So again, there, we really try to recommend that more passive, no, sorry, more active intervention, um, whereas the Bobath and Bocha are considered more passive. So we're really trying to get kids um, to, to be motivated to move. So it is kind of setting up their environment and helping parents learn how do we position things to get kids um, just the right amount of support and a bit of a challenge to figure out how to move on their own. So that may be 
positioning like a favorite toy just out of their reach. So they are um, trying to figure out how to, to roll over or to scoot to reach that. And that, that child actively figuring it out and that active motor planning really seems to activate the neuroplasticity more than say, um, you know, if we're just stretching a child and trying to, you know, do hand over hand with them. Um, so really trying to kind of set up that environment to make it Sometimes our therapists will talk about the just right challenge. So you want to make, you want to motivate the child to move, but also give them enough support and not make it too hard that they get frustrated. Um, and so that's where um, a lot of our early um, PT and OT are helping parents on how to kind of set up the toys and set up the environment to, um, to enhance and just to really stimulate the child to want to move. All right. Well, it looks like that was the last question that we got, at least in the chat. All right. Well, well thank uh, you. I would like to uh, have a, qu a question for Dr. Steingast. You, you mentioned four of the tools to make an early diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Which of the four do you recommend for, for a pediatrician before referring to, to a developmental specialist, which is the easiest, the one that could make uh, day by day uh, at, at the office. So yeah, so these these tools are tend to be used more in a specialized clinic. Um, if a, probably the one that is most, um, let me move to that slide, um, most accessible or for a general PD to, to learn would be the, the high neurologic exam. So the general movements assessment is really a fairly intense training. And like you have to, they say you have to be doing it several times a week to really kind of keep your reliability. Um, the high is, if you actually look at the form, they're similar to the, the do with or Ballard scales that we may use to assess gestational age. So they actually designed this to be with the goal of it having it be accessible to all clinicians. Um, and they have taught it to people in, um, in a variety of countries. In the last few years, as they've realized how predictive this is for CP, um, there's been more of a move to have standardized training. It, um, one of the early stuff was thought that you can kind of read it and see the pictures and learn it, but um, the, Cerebral Palsy Foundation has, um, has trainings available with that. So that is probably the most accessible to do in an office. It takes like five to 10 minutes. Uh, it may still be more time than a lot of general pediatricians are gonna have. Um, so a lot of that is gonna be more those developmental screening tools and looking at, that are looking at is the child, where's the child in meeting their motor milestones. Thank you. Well, thank you for your excellent uh, presentation to both of you. Thank you very much. We don't want to leave without asking you one final take home message, message for our audience. I think our, our, um, our take home message would be um, to not delay. And if you're concerned to, um, to proceed with evaluating a child and getting intervention started. Um, there's don't, we, we don't want to do the watch and wait in these cases. Rosano. Muy de acuerdo. Es el, y, y digo, agregando, además de si ustedes tienen esa preocupación, es si la familia tiene la preocupación. Eh, ese es el, el principal este, indicador de que algo podría estar sucediendo. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much to both of you. Uh, muchas gracias a todo nuestro, nuestro auditorio. Y les recordamos que nos hagan favor de llenar la encuesta de satisfacción y que tengan un excelente día. Muchas gracias. Thank Señor, you, gracias. Dr. Stengas, Tolosano. Thank you. Gracias. Have a good day.